Hello everybody, and welcome to Drydock episode 12. And now that competitions, announcements, and all other such like things are out of the way, we can go straight into the questions once more. So, let's do that. Civil Williams asks, What do you think a modernised Barden-class battleship would look like if, for some reason or other, they were returned to the Reichsmarine? Well, I imagine the first thing they probably would have done post-war is uh, rip out the mixed power plant and replace it with a pure oil-fired one, along with more modern engines. So it might actually have gotten a bit faster than the uh, 22 knots that it was capable of in real life. Needless to say, the underwater torpedo tubes would probably also have gone, and the secondary battery probably also would have been revised. Unfortunately, their layout as built doesn't really lend themselves towards a kind of uh, midlife upgrade to have significant anti-aircraft defences and such. So it is either going to end up with a smattering of light AA going into World War II, which is probably going to render it quite vulnerable, or alternatively, if they take a cue off what happened to the Queen Elizabeth and Warspite in the Royal Navy, they might take it in for a full rebuild where they'll probably strip out the superstructure and replace it with a single piece of superstructure, maybe in a single funnel. That will free up a lot of space just before the rear turrets. And I would imagine probably either cutting back or building forward the casements uh, to enable them to be replaced with other other guns, um, whether that's additional, like 128s or 105s or something like that, um, that would be the optimal. But given the resources of Nazi Germany, I think it's probably more likely we see a single funnel, all oil-fired, uh, slightly revised layout one, with uh, some 88 and 105mm AA tucked in where the second funnel is on the original design. Sir Ruffellot says, uh, You mentioned in one of your dry dock episodes that the Nelson was a relatively efficient design. How efficient would you say the Richelieu and Dunkirk are compared to the Nelson as ships with their main armaments concentrated around the bow? What are the design advantages and disadvantages between the early Richelieus compared to the more conventional layout like that of Gascon? So compared to the Nelson class, the French ships weren't quite as efficient with their armour layout. If you look at the Richelieu versus Nelson, you'll notice that the turrets on the French ship are spaced further apart, which means the forward turret is further forward than it necessarily needs to be, compared to, say, the Nelson's turrets. You can see the super-firing turret, the barrels actually overlap the roof of the next turret forward. And further back, the Nelsons have the rangefinders for the secondary battery further aft, which means that the secondary battery itself can be slightly further forward, which means the armour belt itself can be shorter. So the Richelieu's and Dunkirk's kind of threw away a little bit of the advantage of the all-forward armament by, at least in my opinion, unnecessarily spacing everything out, um, with a bit of a change around of the secondary battery there and pulling the forward turret back a little bit they could have significantly shortened the armor belt which would have meant it could be significantly thicker and therefore better protect the ship now compared with that the gascon obviously it gives you a rear firing option which the richelieu's lack however it does stretch the armor belt out again possibly slightly unnecessarily i can understand why they put the secondary battery all on the center line because it meant you could get away with fewer secondary turrets for the same broadside uh, but again it does unnecessarily lengthen the citadel beyond what is strictly necessary and with a main turret forward and a main turret aft you can't actually really thin it out um, at all between the start and end of the turrets so the Gascon class, it sacrifices some of the armour efficiencies, which, as we said, admittedly, the French didn't take full advantage of, uh, in favour of rear-firing for the main battery and having to get a, and getting a superior secondary broadside. But, on the other hand, spacing the armament out means it's somewhat less likely that you'll lose your entire main armament to one particularly catastrophic hit. Kevin Willemsey asks... Can you elaborate on the kind of maintenance required for battleships? At what point is it no longer economical to maintain or keep a battleship in service? Many battleships had a 20-year service life, uh, but when the service lives of the Iowa span many more decades, why is that? Uh, question the second, please explain your YouTube channel name. Oh, it was going to happen eventually, wasn't it? So question one with maintenance. 
basically battleships, kind of like aircraft these days, which have a certain number of flight hours on them once they are built. And once you exceed that, you need to do some serious work or else they are no longer safe to use. Similarly, battleships were designed for operations over a certain amount of years. Now, obviously, the armament of ships, the size of ships, their protection, etc., tended to obsolete battleships after a certain amount of time anyway, so this was taken into account when planning for the service life of a ship. So in the heyday of battleships, the main driver to when it was no longer economical to keep a battleship in service was when it was no longer really viable as a frontline unit. Uh, you'll see that during the Second World War, even though the war was still raging, uh, a number of the R-Class were retired before the war's end, purely because they no longer really had much use outside of coastal bombardment roles, and to be honest, there were other battleships that were better at that and could still have a fleet role uh, by the time 1944-1945 rolled around. But assuming you hit some kind of plateau as far as armour and armament are concerned, which kind of happened during the 20s and 30s, which is why you've got things like the Queen Elizabeths that... Uh, were constructed in the, lat in the first half of the 1910s and were still around at the end of the 1940s. The main item is engines. You can patch and repair and modify the engines so many times, but ultimately they get to a point where your engines or boilers are simply clogged up, inefficient and falling apart. HMS Hood was right at the tail end of its engine lifespan, for instance, in 1941 when it was sunk. And because the engines are right down deep in the ship and you've designed a ship specifically so that stuff isn't able to easily get right down deep into the ship, when that period arrives, you have to make a decision of are you going to keep this ship in service or not. If you are, then you essentially have to rip apart the ship. You have to take off at least the rear turrets usually, um, open it all the way up, lift out all the old engines and equipment and replace them with new stuff. Now that's obviously a very long process, it's a very expensive process and you're doing such major structural work to the ship that there really isn't any reason not to do other significant upgrades and that's why you see with uh, things like the Queen Elizabeth and the War Spite and such like, and also the American battleships that were sunk at Pearl Harbor when they were refloated. The amount of work done to them in terms of changing their anti-aircraft armament up as well as the machinery, etc., basically renders them almost new ships coming out of it. But that's a lot of money to invest, so you have to decide, is the ship going to be worth that investment? Is it going to be around for another 10, 15 years? So that's that's your main tipping point of when a ship is no longer economical to maintain or keep in service. Now, the Iowas kind of luck out because they were constructed and completed about halfway through the Second World War and onwards. So they didn't see nearly the same amount of use during the Second World War that most other battleships, including all the other US battleships, actually did. So their engines and other machinery was nowhere near as worn out. And although they were still in service all the way up to within our lifetimes, the fact of the matter is that their actual service lives technically actually don't cover that span uh, because they were repeatedly put into long-term reserve, where obviously they're not doing anything, and then brought back out again. So their actual active service life it's probably similar to most other battleships, maybe 25, 30 years. It's just that, that that time was used up in segments with long periods of inactivity. With decent care, a battleship can last a very long time in storage. But that said, if you ask any of the US Navy crew who've served on board um, any of the Iowa class, they will tell you that whilst they were technically in reserve right up into the 2000s, a couple of them, especially as far as I understand it, the Iowa, their steam plants were basically on the verge of giving out. They'd basically reached the end of their lifespan, so bringing them back into service again would have been very questionable. And then they would have probably needed a complete rebuild and rip up, kind of like the War Spite and Queen Elizabeth had, as we mentioned before, um, to replace those engines if you'd wanted to keep them going into the 21st century in a full service manner. Now, as for the YouTube channel name, 
the YouTube channel has been around for over a decade, I think. Um, I just established it using my u common username that I use across most of the internet, which explains why it really doesn't have that much to do with warships themselves. Now, as to whether it has any relation to the Drachenfels Mountains in Germany, e kind of. They have a, the two words have a similar meaning there, but from a different language. So, yeah, there, there's a certain amount of uh, crossover there. As for the language the YouTube channel name is derived from, well, I've got to have a few secrets, don't I? John Fisher asks. Why do people, even today, rave about the awesome firepower of Bismarck's main guns, yet sneer at vanguards when both ships had eight 15-inch guns? Although an older design, the British gun and its turret were considered one of the best designs ever produced. Additionally, the German 15-inch shell was much lighter than the British and had a higher failure rate. Well, a lot of it comes from a very shallow surface reading of people who just look at the two ships and go, oh, well, one of them's got guns from World War One. It must be worse. Uh, uh, uh. Um, yeah, probably the kind of people you don't really want to be paying that much attention to when it comes to detailed analysis of a warship's firepower. Now, that said, the German gun was newer and did have a number of advantages over the 1542, but as you said, the 1542 British gun was a very powerful, very capable weapon in and of its own right. So the fact that they're separated by nearly two decades um, is not quite as evident as you might think. Now, to do a quick comparison, obviously the British gun is 42 calibers long. The German gun is just over 51 calibers long, which makes it a longer barreled gun and therefore likely to have a higher muzzle velocity. The German gun, in theory, has a higher rate of fire, but in practice, the ammo handling systems on the 15-inch German gun were very finicky, and for trying to fire at full speed tended to make them break. So, reliably speaking, both guns are kind of limited to about two rounds a minute. The German shell is about 70 kilos lighter and carries just under two kilos less explosive in its bursting charge. In exchange for this, its muzzle velocity is about 10% higher than the British gun. Now, this does give the German shell better penetration at range. Uh, so we've got about 4 inches more penetration than the British gun at about 20,000 yards, which is around the range that most World War II uh, naval gunfights tended to start at, give or take a few thousand yards. Although, given Bismarck's armour and the armour of its various targets, it kind of means that both sides were capable of hurting the other, albeit the British gun only just. Now, what changes is if the British ship is using supercharges. Now, the supercharge for the British 15-inch 42 calibre gun, for those of you who don't know, was a way the British tried to update the 15-inch 42 to keep it competitive with the leading guns of World War II. Normally, the charge used in a gun is a certain percentage of that which is considered the maximum safe to use, because obviously with variations in how each gun is made and variations in the uh, capacity of the individual charges, there is a possibility that if you try and fire at full, absolute full capacity every single time, you're likely to blow up the gun at some point, and this is bad. However, the British kind of almost took it up to the maximum with the supercharges to get more muzzle velocity and therefore greater penetration and range out of the guns. There is a little bit of debate amongst historians, as I mentioned in some previous videos, about whether or not HMS Vanguard was designed to take supercharges. Some people say that she wasn't based on the fact that she never actually carried them, but obviously the supercharges causing extra wear on the guns would only really have been issued in wartime. And I default on the side of D.K. Brown, who was actually working for the Royal Navy, if you can believe it, at the time that Vanguard was being completed. And he categorically states after reviewing Royal Navy review records that the gun mountings, the guns themselves, the shell rooms, etc., everything about Vanguard's fire firing system for its main battery were specifically designed to allow for the use of superchargers. It's just that Vanguard was finished after the war, so they never actually bothered issuing them.
So, in a conflict situation, it is reasonable to assume, based on that, that the Vanguard would have used superchargers, and how does that change things? Well, it's another 28 kilos of propellant, which actually moves the charge to about as much over the German uh, propellant charge as it was under using standard charges. And velocity-wise, this basically roughly moves the penetration tables up by about 5,000 yards, which puts the penetration values of the 15-inch 42 within shouting distance, or about equal to, depending on which particular gunnery chart you choose, to the German gun. So a British 15-inch 42 caliber on the Vanguard firing superchargers has basically the same performance as a German uh, 15-inch 52-ish caliber gun on the Bismarck, except that the British shell it will carry slightly more explosive in its bursting charge and therefore do slightly more damage when it explodes. Now, as for shell failure rates, yes, the German shells did fail much more regularly than the British 15-inch 42 in World War II, um, one famous example being the dud that fetched up in Prince of Wales during the Battle of the Denmark Strait. On the flip side, the British 15-inch shells at Jutland were nothing particularly to write home about, and by the time of World War II they'd had sort of 20, 25 years to work the kinks out, so one would hope that the British shells were slightly more reliable by the, that time. James Leons asks, uh, how does the accuracy of main guns on battleships in different navies compare? Well, this has been covered a little bit before in other dry dock questions, but... Basically, it comes down to a combination of shell quality, and shell quality is what really did in um, the Richelieu's main battery initially, and the Italian guns on the Latorias generally uh, made them very inaccurate, and in the French case, liable to explode, which was not necessarily a good thing for the French. Outside of that, the things to avoid were overpowering the gun. Um, there were some very respectable sort of 50 calibre and thereabouts high velocity naval guns brought in, but if you overegged it too much, the guns would tend to whip. And yes, you, if you could imagine several hundred tons of gun barrel actually whipping um, due to the shock of the explosion, but that would disrupt your accuracy. Other things to avoid, it, uh, you don't want to have all your guns in a perfectly nice even line all firing at the same time. Uh, American triple 14 inch guns had this problem. Uh, they bunched the guns a little bit too close together and as a result the blast from the outer guns interfered with the inner gun. Um, they solved that initially by in, uh, putting interrupter gear so the centre gun fired a little bit later and you can see on the town class cruisers that this problem was addressed by setting one of the guns, that being the middle one, slightly further back. Of course, manufacturing quality of the guns also helped, but to be honest, uh, as we covered in the question about how to build a naval gun, if you get that so badly wrong you're going to be seriously affecting accuracy, you're probably also going to blow the gun clean up on your turret, which is going to be more of a problem than the fact the shell missed. And last of all, of course, the fire control system and stabilisation. The stabilisation is very important because it needs to keep the gun in the same relative position and angle, even though the ship is obviously going to be pitching and rolling and moving in three dimensions through the ocean, and the fire control system to tell the gun where it's supposed to point uh, in order to hit the target. And these fire control systems generally, outside of the outliers of like the Italian shell quality issues, are the things that make most of the difference. Occasionally people just seem to hit it spot on for whatever reason. Uh, the 15 inch 42 caliber gun that we were talking about earlier just seems to somehow have worked out to be a very 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 accurate gun almost regardless of what fire control system you stuck on it. Whereas um, something like the American 16-inch 50 gun is on paper a very accurate gun, and with the correct fire control systems is a very accurate gun. But in the World War II period, when you look at some of the engagements they were involved in, something was up with those, because their accuracy wasn't quite as good as it was elsewhere. <laughs> 
one of the main things to bear in mind with fire control systems is that whatever system you use it has to be fairly robust and it has to be fairly easy to use one of the main downsides with a number of nations fire control systems were that they were either absolutely fantastic but incredibly delicate which meant the instant your ship took a hit or even as much as a near miss they went out of alignment or broke which obviously is not very useful or if in certain circumstances, some of the German fire control systems, you basically had to have 20-20 vision and be absolutely top of the ball, physically fit and alert in order to properly use them. And once you got tired, exhausted, distracted, injured, or you just didn't have perfect vision, their accuracy diminished massively, which, given that combat is a fairly fatiguing environment to be in, is, again, not the wisest of decisions. But you'll tend to find across the board there are an awful lot of military systems that work perfectly fine on paper and might work perfectly fine in practice and the instant you put them into the actual conditions of war they just break. Uh, that's not really anything other than a universal theme as I'm sure any active service members uh, who are watching this or former service members will be able to verify. Now, in order that the poor old people in the Discord don't get left out, because we have a channel there purely dedicated for dried up questions, um, but going purely through the list I've gathered off of YouTube, there's still another 20 pages of questions, so they virtually never get answered. I'm going to, going forward, this dry dock is going to be about the first 20 minutes will be questions gathered and farmed off of the YouTube channel itself, and the last 10 minutes will be questions from the Discord. So, with that in mind, Luchs asks, what are some differences between ironclad battleships like HMS Devastation and a later pre-dreadnoughts? That is actually a very insightful question, so let's take a look. So let's take a look. At first glance you might think, oh, so much, so much the same. Devastation has four 12-inch guns in two twin turrets, one forward, one aft. So does Majestic. Um, they both have belt armor in the sort of standard range of 9 to 12 inches. Okay, so that looks all the same. And they've both got a mixed secondary battery of a various calibers of guns. So, where's the difference? Well, there's a lot underlying that. For a start, size-wise, uh, Devastation displaces about 9,000 tons standard and 13,000 tons fully loaded, the Majestic class is actually pushing 16,000 tons and is over 100 feet longer. So there's a big change right there. Now, speed-wise, Devastation can make about 14 knots, Majestic can make 16 knots, so eh, maybe not so much of a difference there. However, Majestic carries about 200 more crew, with a complement of 672, as compared to Devastation's maximum complement of 410, so actually just over 200 more crew. But where there seem to be similarities, those are also actually differences. For example, the armour of the Devastation is 12 to 14 inches thick, and you might think, well, that compares favourably with Majestic's 9 inches of armour. But the Devastation's armour is wrought iron, whereas the Majestic's armour is Harvey Steel, which is basically the first proper practical steel armour on battleships, and is significantly better at protecting the ship than wrought iron. So although it has a thinner belt, the Majestic's belt is actually much better at protecting it. Devastation also launched with just those two turrets as its main weaponry. They actually needed a rebuild to carry further weaponry, and then they were given a bunch of quick firings, 47mm, 57mm guns, and some light machine guns. Whereas Majestic, from the start, was designed to have a secondary battery, and that secondary battery included quick firing 6-inch guns, as well as the whole array of smaller guns, as with Devastation's refit. The other thing is the main guns themselves. The Majestic's guns are 35 caliber breech loading weapons with an effective firing range of about 10,000 yards. The Devastation's guns, by contrast, are much shorter 16 caliber length guns with a much, much less effect, uh, shorter uh, effective range. So, yeah, whilst on the surface they appear similar, the Majestic and the later pre-dreadnoughts basically show what you can do with about 20 years of technological advancement and an extra 6,000 tonnes of displacement.
Paul from Chicago wants to know what the deal is with the Ironhold frigates such as HMS Megara that predate HMS Warrior. Now, these Iron Hulled ships, as opposed to Iron Armoured ships, which will come later, were a little bit of a full start in the Iron Ship Age. They came about because uh, you had the gunboat Nemesis that was used in Chinese waters that showed itself, even though it was iron hulled with just some wooden backing, it could resist pretty much all the cannon fire that was coming in at it. Bearing in mind this was an era where you just had very basic explosive shell and solid cannon shot, and there wasn't really much in the way of armour piercing anywhere to be seen. So the Admiralty, which contrary to popular opinion was actually quite progressive, thought, hmm, this looks like a uh, technological tactical advantage we could get our hands on, let's commission some iron-hulled frigates. Unfortunately, in the period between actually ordering them and them coming into service, uh, two factors arose. One of which was that the Royal Navy figured out that whilst high-velocity cannonballs could punch through an iron hull and leave a relatively small hole, which was much better than smashing a big hole in a wooden ship with wooden splinters going everywhere, it turned out a lower-velocity shot could actually blow a much bigger hole than the size of the cannonball in an iron hull that wasn't armoured which was a major problem because you do not want a very big hole in the side of your ship when your ship is in the water because this leads to flooding and then your ship goes down and then everyone is very sad. So that was one problem. Uh, they thought they might be able to solve that particular issue with some teak backing, although that would obviously begin to obviate the weight savings uh, that would result from using a thinner iron hull as opposed to a thicker wooden one. Now, the other factor that showed up in tests was something that wasn't immediately foreseeable at the time, although it might look fairly obvious in hindsight, if you happen to be a metallurgist or an engineer, anyway. Um, and that was that the Nemesis had been operating in Chinese waters, which were warm and in a warm environment, and the wrought iron that was produced in the period, which was produced in quantities large enough for use in ships, had the rather interesting property of changing its physical resistance and behaviour over a temperature range that was actually quite common in the world. Namely, that is, if it was operating in what we would consider a warm place, like, say, China or the tropical areas, the metal was a bit more ductile, that is to say it's a little bit more bendable, it would absorb shock better, and if it broke it would tend to rip and tear rather than shatter. However, once you brought it into colder waters, like say, I don't know, England uh, and the English Channel and the North Sea, the metal suddenly became a lot more brittle and tended to shatter a bit like glass and then you had big holes and lots of flying splinters and shards and everybody was then cut up and stabbed and it was all a very big tragedy. So the Royal Navy decided rather hastily that it was not going to put ships that could potentially turn into effectively gigantic grenades into service when they would not really be usable in its primary theatre of combat operations, which was in and around the UK. They might just about be workable in the Mediterranean, but you don't want to build a ship that only works in certain temperatures. Uh, although you might say that some modern navies and ships could learn a lesson from that, not looking at any class in particular, Type 45. And so those early iron-hulled frigates were not commissioned as frigates, they ended up being commissioned as transports of various types, including the HMS Birkenhead, which gave us the Birkenhead drill and the tradition of women and children first when abandoning ship. And to round out this video, just to make sure we don't end up with two questions from the same person in one rego, um, Krasirmir Kozinek says, how effective was high explosive in ship-to-ship -ship combat? How often was it used? In what situations? And why? Well, how effective depended on the era. The initial debut of high explosive shells was in the early 1800s, and they were very effective at the time. Just ask the Turkish fleet at the Battle of Sinop. Although that particular 
particular battle, uh, there's a bit more of a story behind that. It it was kind of a foregone conclusion anyway, shell guns or not. But anyway, in the era of wooden warships, uh, a reliable high explosive shell was absolutely devastating. Once you got into the era of the ironclad, it was significantly less devastating because it would just explode on the outside and in the open air the explosive force would mostly dissipate into the atmosphere and it didn't do very much however as armor piercing shells came into effect then the overall citadel of the ship had to be shrunk more and more in order to incorporate thicker and thicker armor which then led to a resurgence of high explosive because now lots of parts of the ship were unarmored and therefore vulnerable again and in a reaction as you always get with these kinds of uh, arms races you ended up with ships deploying thinner plates of armor outside of their citadels at the expense of the citadels themselves, although they're not, not too much as the design went. Um, and the idea of these thinner plates was to detonate high explosive shells outside of the hull, similar to had, as they had done before, in order to prevent the ship being blown apart by high explosive without the citadel needing to be breached. This was primarily the rationale behind having the mass numbers of quick-firing guns on a lot of pre-dreadnought ships, because it was recognised that, yeah, maybe a 5, 6 or 7-inch gun isn't going to penetrate the main armour belt, but you can sure as hell smash a lot of things with a uh, high explosive. The apogee of this situation was probably actually the CPC shell developed by the British in the 1900s and in the run-up to World War I, and this was basically what we nowadays would probably call a semi-armour-piercing shell, where they equipped uh, large-caliber shells with just enough armour-piercing capability to punch through thin armour plate, like, say, the type that was protecting the non citadel parts of an enemy ship, but still carried a massive bursting charge similar to a full HE shell. These could and would have been incredibly effective and devastating against most targets, but as with most things, time moved on very quickly, and the protective uh, plates outside of the citadel got thicker, rendering CPC far less effective, and as the move to all big gunships came about, you really just had to fling AP at things because at the ranges that you were getting up to, it just wasn't worth taking, again, a selective weapon. AP would do a fair bit of damage, whatever it hit, whereas CPC would do damage assuming it didn't hit the ship's centre of mass where the citadel was, and that was a risk that you probably didn't want to take. That is, of course, against battleships. Uh, cruisers, you could use HE against them most of the time, especially if you were a battleship, although they did have armour, so you still probably needed to use AP against them if you were another cruiser. Um, but as if you wanted to overwhelm with a hail of fire, it didn't really matter what, else, what you were firing at them. Destroyers... Yeah, basically HE. Um, some destroyers had uh, semi-armor piercing shells, but a lot of destroyers actually went to sea without any AP whatsoever because um, just HE was fine. Destroyers aren't really known for their armor, and if you get hit by a, a shell from a battleship, HE will actually do a lot more damage, as we saw at the Battle of Samar. Uh, AP from a very big battleship will just go straight through a destroyer and out the other side, which actually, believe it or not, doesn't do that much damage unless it hits something really vital on the way through. So that wraps up the dry dock for this week. Hope you had fun. I uh, hope no one minds me p pulling some questions from the Discord just to keep make sure everyone's getting a fair shake. And I will see you again for the next video. Thanks very much.